please welcome Marco Bizarre, President and Chief Executive Officer, Gucci. Good morning, everyone. If you look at this number, what comes up to your mind? Anybody? My age? <laughs> I wish. Oh, actually not. Um, yesterday we had the chance, uh, in honor of the WWD conference, or James, uh, <laughs> Bridget, um, we had this um, uh, possibility to announce our results, our quarterly results. Um, and we presented an astonishing plus 49%. That um, is quite impressive considering that the industry is almost flat um, and is a result of some choices. But when I saw the, those results, I was asking myself uh, back in October 1st when we, we accounted everything with the CFOs, um, how, how did I feel about How do I feel about uh, this result? And there was a, there's a story that came up to my mind. Um, some months ago, I was in, uh, in Taipei, uh, in Taiwan, and I was negotiating with this landlord that has this, our, our location, our biggest location in, um, in Taiwan. And we were discussing financial condition, uh, lease terms, all this kind of thing during the lunch. And after we, we reached an agreement, he told me, uh, you know, Marco, um, the other day, I need to tell you this story. Uh, the other day, uh, my daughter was texting to a friend. And, uh, and of course, as, uh, like uh, any concerned dad, I was trying to understand what she was writing. And um, in looking at that, I saw that she was te texting a Phil Gucci. And I was uh, quite shocked, considering that uh, my daughter was 16, uh, writing and texting I Phil Gucci. So I asked her, uh, what do you mean about that? And of course, I needed to show that I was looking at her texts. But, um, and uh, she said, you know that? I feel Gucci, I feel good. And that to me is very interesting because it's a different approach about figures. And last night we had this um, amazing dinner. There was this beautiful conversation that Bridget had with, uh, with Karl Lagerfeld. It was really amazing. And at a certain point, the two grandsons of, uh, of Karl, they were sitting uh, to the table close to us, they were uh, staring at me. And um, at a certain point, and I knew that from, uh, from mice, they asked their father, can I go to introduce ourselves to Mark, Mr. Bizzarri? So they came to me, six years old and nine years old, and they said, you know what? I love Gucci. I love the clothing of Gucci. <laughs> and I, I don't know, I, I have to try to put that on the paper. It's quite impressive. Uh, I have this picture. You can see that. Uh, to me, this is priceless uh, for all the rest, as you know. Um, and this, uh, this, to me, really give the idea that these numbers are very much a consequence of choices. And the impact that Alessandro Michele, my creative director, my Gucci creative director, it's not my creative director, it's not my impact, <laughs> that is really the one that brought everything to life. The reason why is this guy is able to interact with this new generation, uh, how, how we should call uh, a six years old, generation whatever, I don't know. <laughs> there are so many names now. But it's, it's the fact that it's so authentic, so genuine, so speaking clearly. So it doesn't mean necessarily that everybody's gonna like it, that's part of the game, but seeing the results, it looks like most of them are liking it. So this is, uh, this is what um, I said to Bridget back in uh, January 22, 22nd, 2015. That was my first interview as a CEO of Gucci. And um, we announced after the first show of, of Alessandro his appointment. Is, uh, Alessandro is by very far the, um, my best choice, my best professional choice. Uh, it's actually it's been the only one because the team that we have today was exactly the team that was there before. So no change, some promotion. But overall, it's exactly the same team. And I, th I think that is, is, is sharing with me the same, the same passion to work together. One of the questions that comes uh, uh, more often, uh, considering the, this cho the choice of Alessandro, is uh, 
if there is a magic formula in what is being done, because if, if I go back from now, from today, to three years ago, I should easily write a case study about Gucci. All the decisions we took, how brave we were, how smart we were. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's no possibility. If there's someone here, we, there are some good identities in the, in, 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 in the, in the room. If you ask me to do the same thing in another company, I, I, I cannot do it. It's impossible to replicate it. Because time is a super important variable. The momentum is important. In that specific moment, the fashion industry was a little bit boring. Everybody was doing exactly the same, and Daniela was mentioning that before, it's so true. We need to make sure that we, we, we disrupting, is, I don't think, is a little bit abused in terms of wording, because today, challenging the status quo is, is, a, is a rule. It's not even more a choice. So the, the point is, uh, when, we, when we tried back, in, back three years ago to reshape uh, Gucci, I need to understand what Gucci was about and the people that were around Gucci. Because the people are very different from, company to, from, from a company to the other. And that makes a big difference. And this particular time, that was the right thing to do. So, uh, just to give you a little bit of insight, I can tell you, I could tell you so many stories about how smart I was in choosing Alessandro. But in fact, it was completely by chance. Alessandro was not in the list of the candidates that all the most prominent editors prepared for me when I joined Gucci. He was not in it. He's, uh, he was working in the company for 12 years. Uh, so he was doing exactly the kind of design that he didn't want to continue. And I could tell you that I was so brave in discovering this hidden treasure uh, behind the scenes. But in reality, it just happened that I, I asked my uh, human resources director, tell me one name in the design team that is able to tell me about the processes of Gucci in terms of design. So it happened to be Alessandro. So I met him in his apartment because at that time Frida Giannini was still the creative director of, of Gucci, so we couldn't show this kind of <coughs> connection. And he invited me um, at his apartment and, you know, intuition in this case is, is super important, even more than intellect and, and rationality. He opened the door, he was wearing the priest town with the furs, you know, the low furs with the furs. At that time they were fur, now they're not anymore. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and what I loved about that is that in the farm I, was, I, I had the chance to look at the kind of he was collecting the way in which he was talking about different topics or different moments in history and linking them together, creating something new. We were really uh, thinking about the same way for me from a positioning and business standpoint and even from an aesthetic standpoint. And, and it was very much about empathy. It was much about intuition. It was much about uh, you feel that you found the right person immediately. So no rational thinking too much, because the, the, all, everything, all the boxes were saying to me, is not the right person, all of them. So um, I, I had the chance to go back to the interview that Bridget gave to me uh, back three years ago. And if you go through all of this topic, it's, it's quite interesting how clear, not because I did it, was the vision. Also, because I did as well. But, and if you look at today, it's exactly what happened. In that specific moment, everybody, everybody was talking about rational topics, craftsmanship, quality, all these kinds of things. This is all rational. They speak to a part of the brain that is not the one of, of emotion. And I remember still, still Gucci at that time, to the investor, to the analyst, they were delivering the information according to how much revenues is driven by logo, how much revenue is not driven by logo. And the more the no logo product were sold, the better it was worse. So think about how stupid it is. No? So you work for a brand to create a logo for 100 years, and you, you don't want to talk about it. 
That to me is quite strange. You invest so much money, any show that you do, you pick like a coin in the brand equity. And then you don't want to talk about it, you're kind of ashamed. So of course, there are some brands. I come from Bottega Veneta, so it's a no-logo company, so you can, you can appreciate the fact that every brand is different. But in Gucci, why we should have been ashamed of, of presenting it? So this is, uh, uh, the point that I want to deliver is, is, uh, is, uh, is, is clear. Emotions were put again at the center of the strategy of Gucci. The creativity was put again at the center of the strategy of Gucci. All the rest was, was, uh, was uh, going around. And last night, Karl Lagerfeld was said that very, very clearly. The CEOs that he's working with, most of them, they are deliver, they're giving him the possibility to express himself. No boundaries. I never spoke to Alessandro in three years of if one single figure, one single figure. Not even one single budget. Because the potential upside that I can have with the creativity of Alessandro from a business point is much, much bigger than one million euro that I can put in a show, less or more. Of course, you need to have the right talent, otherwise it's a waste of time and a waste of money. But when you find it, then you need to protect it. Because it's very easy to say, I want to make a disruption. I want to change. Everybody wants to speak about innovation, change. In, I mean, in all the meetings that I do, everybody's talking about innovation. They say, you, you agree with me, we're gonna innovate, of course. But then you go to the same restaurant, you buy the same brand, you buy the same clothes, you wear the same T-shirt. It's a human behavior. Everybody's doing exactly the same thing they was doing yesterday. It's normal, so you need to force it. And especially for talent, when you do the change, we, we did a, a really, from a creative standpoint, we did a huge change in, the, in that specific moment. Then you have 12 months where you don't see any result because the product needs to go into the shop. And think about Gucci. Gucci is a, is a company of 11,000 people direct. $5 billion at the end of September, year to date. 45,000 people that they work 100% for Gucci, so they're not direct employed, but they work for Gucci. So it's a big company. Uh, it's a big company, it's, it's, it's absolutely the, the way in which you cannot think that changing culture is easy. So when you need to wait for 12 months, to wait that the product starts creating results and getting, all, getting rid of, of all the product that you have in the 500 shops, then you can see or appreciate if you are successful or not. But in the meantime, what you need to do, you need to make sure that this guy is protected. Because he was completely bombarded by everybody, journalists, consumers, social. At the beginning, everybody, most of them, not all of them, were against him. The normal comment in Instagram was, please give us back Frida. That is what the normal comment in the first 12 months. There was an amazing financial newspaper that after three months, March 15, in the headline said, the new strategy of Gucci is not working. It's financial times. <laughs> so, if, if a newspaper like Financial Times doesn't understand the rule of the business, call me. Give me a call. <laughs> I'm going to explain to you. Take your time instead of writing these kind of things. I mean, it's, a, it's a disaster for everybody because then the investors they start trembling. My boss, again, <laughs> is pushing me. So it's not an easy, it's not an easy task to try to, to make sure that these people are able to really be creative that are protected. That is the most difficult thing, especially at the beginning, because now it's, it's successful, so every, that was much easier. Everybody knows what Gucci stands for. It was not the case before. So culture. Culture is important. When I say emotion should be at the center of the, of the strategy, and creativity should be at the center of the strategy, because fashion is, is what it was from the very beginning. It's not a marketing-driven topic. It's not at all. Fashion, especially luxury fashion, needs to anticipate trends. You need to listen to consumer for the super short term, but not too much. Because the, show, the, the consumer, they want to have the bag that they, is working today. They lack to have people like Alessandro, this creative talent, that are able to anticipate trends. And to anticipate trends, you're going to have problems at the beginning. 
But this is the only way in which you can lead an industry. So considering that scalability was put at the center of the strategy, then the kind of culture that needed to, to push forward was about respect, about passion, about energy, about smile, about inclusivity, about respect to diversity, because I'm completely convinced that in this way, I can foster creativity. I don't care about people smiling. They smile a lot in Gucci. I, I like it because in this way, they feel free to take risk. They, they feel free that I'm not going to blame them if they make a mistake. And we need to praise them and to create an incentivized structure to appraise that. And again, it's not easy because when you talk about culture, you don't talk about product, you don't talk about sketch, you talk about human being. And human being is the most strange thing that we need to manage if you can manage a human being. In the moment in which I joined Gucci, uh, the culture of fear was predominant. And I'm not blaming or discussing about the different culture, but the culture of fear has also some many examples of success uh, in, the, in the industry. But that didn't represent my values. And they didn't want to work in a company where the threat was at the center of the, of the, of the daily activity. That's not the way in which I want to, to live or work. So that's the reason why when I read culture, eat strategy at breakfast, I couldn't believe more in that sentence. Because you can write the best strategy possible, but if the culture doesn't support it, you're going to fail. There's no doubt. So this is an ongoing process. That is the most important thing that the CEOs need to do. To be leader today in, 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 in a big company is not to teach. Sometimes you need to unlearn what you learned before. Because the, the world changes too quick. I can never teach to one kid about something specific. He knows much more than myself. I need to put him in the situation to be supported, to finance his, his ideas. So the, the, yeah. so the idea in changing the culture, that again is the most difficult thing, is not sending an email to 11,000 people and say, you know what, be happy. <laughs> Doesn't work, no. So you need, you need to go there and shaking hands and listen, in more, more than talking, visiting, showing respect. Then you can have respect. Then they can recognize you. So that is, I think, is the, is the new role of leadership in, in, in this industry. I will never be able to have the competence of 11,000 people, of the brain of 11,000 people. It's impossible. So, but if I am able to put them together, then, I mean, we are, com we are unbeatable. There's no doubt. So what I, I'm asking to my people, and that is, come, is something that goes uh, through leading by example. It's not, again, it's not something that you write in a newsletter on a daily basis, but it's to remain curious, to remain curious, to maintain the curiosity at a very high level. And um, what did we decided in a company that no is not an answer, not an option. Listen, try to understand why someone is going to propose you something. Because from there, maybe you have an idea. And you can move forward from there. And uh, as I said, the, my role is very much to about to, to inspire people. And it's something that you learn, you learn with experience. That's the reason why you, I still have a job, no start, <laughs> despite my age. And, and if I understand this change, to me, it's very important. And uh, sometimes, uh, I, I, when, I, when I read uh, some comments from other CEOs, and uh, like a few months ago from a CEO of a big company, French, that, <laughs> that released an interview to WWD and was commenting, was commenting on the creativity of Alessandro. He, he, Alessandro presented in the show in uh, Firenze, in Galleria Palatina, un, uh, um, a look from uh, Dapper Dan back in the years. Exactly the same look. So it's clearly an homage to the, to the person. And this CEO, instead of looking at his garden, he was commenting on the fact that that is not, that is not fashion. 
But the point to me is that, first of all, the CEO should understand that their role is not to be creative, but to support creativity, especially not commenting the creativity of other brands. But as well, to foster a culture in a company where people and talent remain and are attracted by the culture. I have so many CVs coming from this company today, moving ideally from them to us, because the kind of culture that is in one, in one company or the other is very, very different. And I tell you, in that specific company that we never mentioned, some years ago, the predecessor that was managing it, to try to steal a person from that company was impossible, despite the money and the package that was going to offer. So it's not a matter of money, it's a matter of respect, trust, that should be played in, in the way from company to company. I never heard the CEO commenting on creativity to someone else. Of course, we are more, let's say, aggressive in the market than we were three years ago, no doubt. They talk about us, fantastic. But don't touch Alessandro, please. Thank you. Um, so the um, one point that I would like to, to uh, outline is that in our business, technology, we spoke a lot about technology today and yesterday, is going to become more and more important in the industry. I mean, it was typically, in fashion, technology was not an important barrier of entry, never been. But it's going to be. 3D printing, uh, LiDAR in vitro, uh, store recognition, a lot of things that can help us. But they're going to remain a tool, especially for our positioning, for luxury positioning. The more we go forward, I think the more people are, are going to be important. Creativity will come from people more and more. They need to use technology to help them, yes. But if we want to differentiate ourselves, I think that we need to really to work and to attract to invest in people, to get the best. And they make sure that they're happy in working for us. They come back at the, at, at the work in the morning with the, with the willingness to, to give, to give something. And, and, and the idea is, is very much what we try to, to instill is a kind of startup mentality. The startup mentality for me is very easy. It's to try to think in Gucci in very small part, where everyone gives something to you. And the idea is like the, John Kennedy was saying. Don't think about what the Americans can do for you, but what you can do for America. So think about what you can do for Marco Bizarre instead. <laughs> um, and to conclude, um, uh, two weeks ago, I gave an interview to an important journalist in Italy. And we were working in our new campus that we opened uh, 12 months ago. And um, we were working, we were chatting, and he told me, you know, Marco, what really strikes me about Gucci is that everybody is smiling. And, and again, I don't care if they smile or not. I mean, we don't need to go out together. The point is that if they smile, it means that they're happy. They're happy. They're, they, they're pushed to do something new and to, to be proactive for the company. So, and hearing that, I knew that I was I mean, in the, in the right, on the right path. So 49 is not my age but it's a consequence of choices, consequence of what people are doing in the company, especially for the new culture whether we try to, to instill. Thank you. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Your presentation made me smile. <laughs> Good. <laughs> No, very interesting culture you're creating at uh, Gucci now. And one of the things you didn't mention, but I know about, is, is that you have a shadow executive committee yes. at Gucci. Can you just tell about the rationale for that and how it functions? The rationale is that um, I'm used to work I mean, with my direct reports, meaning that um, the most senior people in the company, that uh, they always try to please me. Uh, all year, they're all here. <laughs> that, so everything is right in the company, no problem whatsoever. So, but we are 11,000, so I try to, uh, to create a, like a... Uh, bottom-up approach mm -hmm. in two ways. One is uh, create this shadow comics uh, executive committee that is uh, created by people, that is um, uh, structured with people uh, with um, below the age of 30, so just joining or uh, that someone that we think they are very talented, to tell me what is not working. So the task is 
either discussing the same topics that we discussed in the normal executive committee or giving me ideas on different processes that we can, um, we can perform. And the other thing that we tried to do, I started doing lunches with, again, people below 35, I mean, so-called millennials, with the task of giving me three ideas of what we should do in order to improve the life in Gucci. That, of course, is, is, a, is a way to, to start project, to finance project, like in a startup, meaning these, these people, if the project is launched, they're going to report directly to me. They have the money to launch the project, to, to create the project, or they're going to be exposed anyway to myself. So it's a way as well to scout talent that otherwise the seniority, they are gonna, they're going to kill them. There's no doubt. With 11,000 people, they, they, it's very difficult for them to be exposed to, the, to, to myself. And can you give an example of how the Shadow Executive Committee has impacted Gucci on the creative or business side? Yeah, we, we, we launched uh, so many projects, uh, then, uh, some one small, some one, some one more important, and um, that's something that um, can be uh, within in terms of supply chain. We did, uh, we just, we, they come up with an idea that's quite impressive in the, the way in which we, we, we cut the leather uh, today. Uh, we, we tend to use the leather, we use all the leather, so all the scraps is, 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 is thrown away. And, and even if it looks stupid idea, it's very basic. It's, instead, we should cut it before, put it in, in the bags, and this, all this kind of um, uh, waste will not be wasted in the sense that the water will not be used to be t to turn to turn the leather, uh, the chemical will not be used to fix the leather, to fix the color, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So just that, that this idea that came out from uh, these kind of uh, lunches and, and meeting, uh, created a reduction in part on, on environment 20% for the total Gucci. That is a lot. And of course, that is not the solution to the to, to environment, but still, we need to, to preserve the work of like 60,000 people, so we need to balance that with the community and the people. Okay. And, and how do you go about, in a concrete way, sort of fostering a startup mentality in a company with 11,000 employees? It's, a, it's very much a, it's the daily life, the leading by example. It's really much when someone, they know, know is not an is not an ass, is not an option. Um, we tend to, to make sure that the people, they feel uh, confident in presenting new things. When I say before, uh, try to think what you can do for Gucci, uh, it's really, if a process doesn't work, there are many processes that, doesn't, that don't, don't work in Gucci, don't, don't complain. Tell us. We have, a, we have a, a panel that we receive this, this kind of proposal. If we feel that the proposal makes sense, we, we split, uh, we spin off a project, a team, and they work on the project without any uh, responsibility versus the previous boss. And, and then they, they propose a solution. If that is uh, a good solution, we're going to apply it. So the idea, you, we cannot think of changing the project, changing the company by, by myself or by 10 people. It should come from, from, from the bottom. Uh, because in most of the cases, the ideas are much better as well. Okay. Can I impose on you for maybe an example of startup thinking that also impacted or helped Gucci get ahead? Um, Something new that um, um, that we created is the um, we are launching. I don't know if it's official, Robert. I don't know. Yeah, tell. Uh, <laughs> um, we are launching a, 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 something that's called Gucci Places. So places that Alessandro feels that very much Gucci linked. Mm -hmm. One is official. It's called Chatsworth. The one the, the presentation exhibition we did in, in England uh, recently. And we try to create a kind of an ambience where people, if they go there to an app, they, they can discover many things about Gucci that are very much related to the values of, the, of, of Gucci itself. So it's kind of a community that's going to be spread out uh, worldwide uh, in different locations. Uh, and it came it come, it come, it come from these kind of ideas, from, from the lunches or from the shadow of comics. And it, it was pinned off, and they prepared the project. It was presented to the executive committee. It was approved. It's been launched. Um, back to that number 49, the Gucci sales momentum of it has, is very impressive. So what is the strategy to manage this growth and to... Uh... No, I mean, many people are asking me, why don't you grow less? And, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm, I tend to be very optimistic in general. I try to see the, you know, the glass half, half, uh, half full. And uh, you know what I'm enjoying? The, I'm enjoying so well the trip. And I'm enjoying so much. I'm not thinking about next year. Next year, everybody's saying to me, we're going to say, but the comparable growth is going to be a problem for you. You know, I'm going to think about it. I'm working for it already and trying to, to make sure that tomorrow is going to be better. We are working on the cultural organization, new projects. Um, but such a huge opportunity in terms of what we do without extending new product categories. And, um, and you know, we need to enjoy what we are doing. Otherwise, if we do bad, we are, we are bad. 
if you do well, we think that tomorrow is going to be bad. Okay, fine. So, so at a certain point, you need to decide what you want to do in your life. So it's a smile, and enjoy, and uh, we cannot, I cannot be complaining about doing plus 45, 49%. So of course, we are changing all the time. We're trying to push the status quo, especially in successful time. We had uh, meetings with, um, with my team in, uh, in off-site for two days to, to understand which kind of organization we want to, uh, to see in the next 10 years. And again, it's, it's very much about the, the kind of interaction, the, the, the working process that we want to have together and making sure that we really praise people and young kids that are, that are presenting ideas. The idea is we need to leverage what we have and also to leverage as well what we, we, we could get outside. Because in the, the, it's very possible, that especially for the younger generation, the most intelligent people and kids, they don't work for you. They will never work for you because they don't want to have a nine to five work. So how do you connect with them? What kind of crowd creativity you can, we are able to, to intercept? And how can they talk to you and being paid and praised about it? So there are many different ways you, can, you really can leverage and create an organization that is not necessarily stuck uh, into the past, but is, is able to push in, 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 in uh, push boundaries, I think. And it's, it's very much a, a, ment a mentality shift. And that's the reason why we are working together. We are at by uh, other structure. We uh, went uh, two, two weeks ago, I went to study uh, at Singularity University um, to, and to be a little bit brainwashed about this new technology. But this, to me, it's a, it's a way as well to try to, to, to I learn a little bit what I learned in my career in terms of uh, and, and reducing the, this, this tendency that we have to teach and to tell people what to do because it's, it's normal. The more you grow, the, more, the, more, the better the position that you have. You feel like this necessity to tell people you need to do like this because I did like this two years ago. It's not working anymore. And the big shift that um, uh, Alessandro did in, uh, in terms of uh, communication, uh, interaction, uh, I think is, um, is, is, is an example of it. Um, just can you talk a little bit about how the collaborative approach works on the creative side or the business side? Uh, collaborative approach, um, it, it can be either internal or external. But one of the examples that I can, I can uh, tell you is that when uh, um, at a certain point, like um, four months after we started, Alessandro called me and said, Marco, I saw this guy that is doing amazing thing on the walls, on the paper, but for that he's copying the logo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's selling the product with our logo. So, okay, so what, what can you do, Alessandro? But I love what he's doing. And this guy was Trevor Andrew, which ghost. So in the normal situation is um, the CEO called the lawyers, the lawyer called the guy, we sue them, and or we sue him, and then it's, the guy's going to go bankrupt, and we get a little bit of money. So instead, he, saw, he told me, let's try to collaborate, and let's try to, uh, to see how the street, this artist, is able to look at Gucci in a different way. To do so, you need to be very open-minded, because you need to accept a different way of thinking about your logo. You need to think about the possibility of making a big mistake, because I'm not necessarily the consumer will understand that. But this capability of being open, I think, is very modern. Uh, it's very modern, it has been, it's been quite unique. The way in which Alessandro foresee this collaboration is very much a give and take. And it's kind of one plus one that make three instead of two. They would really work together. And from there, we started, we did other collaboration through digital, through social, et cetera. And it's a very natural way of working. And, uh, and that's the reason why we really speak the language in a very genuine way. What you see in terms of digital communication is very much Alessandro. It's him. When I met him, it was Gucci already, like you can see today. So there's nothing fake about what he's doing. And that's the reason why uh, I believe that this uh, success uh, uh, in a kind of a speed, I think. Amazing. I'd love to open up to the floor for questions. We have a few more minutes. Okay, Bridget. Marco, I love that you say that you, a major part of your role is to support the creative. As a CEO who has been in different situations, how do you, do you have to do a, like, push a reset button on your own aesthetic, or how do you, tra how do you, the Bottega aesthetic is so completely different than what Alessandro's doing. How do you readjust from one to the other? First of all, I'm not a, I'm not a designer. 
that I need to remember to me all the time. And uh, it's, it's, it's just a matter of um, respect, I think. Uh, in, in, in the way in which you work, I expect respect from this, the creative director for my competencies. And I'm sure the creative director will ne never be able to do what I do. But I'm sure that I'm not able to do what they do. So as soon as I understand that their capability, their creativity is, is, is something that is, is true, is not fake, that it could last, then to me it's very easy. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of respecting the person more than the creative uh, talent, if you want. And then everything becomes very normal. If I have a problem, I call Lesson and say, look, what we can do like the same thing for him. It's never a fight. It's never me against him or vice versa. It's we work together. And, and when you create this kind of um, um, sincerity, if you want, then it's much, much easier. But you need to, that is, is, is the, then everybody's different. I mean, Stella McCartney was different from uh, Alessandro. Thomas May was different, completely different from Alessandro Michele. But all of them, in their different way of interacting, different way of thinking about the creative process, they are amazing talent. And I think the responsibility for a CEO is very much to make sure that they give the 120%. And, and the role of the CEO is to protect them from, uh, you know, the, the usual thing that can happen in terms of you need to make a result in three months, you need to deliver a, a revenue growth for the Financial Times, and so on. I'm afraid we have no more time for questions. I want to thank you so much, Mark, for this thank you. inspiring talk. Thank you so much.